Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In today's complex economic landscape, understanding the intricacies of financial systems is crucial. David Morgan, a seasoned financial expert, sheds light on historical events and contemporary challenges that impact our financial well-being. In this video, we will delve into Morgan's insights on the Great Depression, callable loans, and the current banking crisis. Additionally, we'll explore his recommendations for safeguarding assets amidst a changing financial climate. Morgan begins by drawing parallels between the current economic climate and the Great Depression of the 1930s. He highlights a lesser-known factor contributing to the collapse of businesses during that era, callable loans. These loans, often undisclosed, allowed banks to demand immediate payment, putting immense pressure on borrowers, particularly farmers and merchants. The callable nature of these loans meant that even if individuals were making mortgage payments regularly, the bank could call in the entire loan amount unexpectedly. This had a cascading effect, squeezing the middle class and leading to widespread financial distress. Morgan suggests that this practice, though not widely acknowledged, played a significant role in exacerbating the economic downturn during the Great Depression. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. In the, in the 30s, uh, why did so many farmers and merchants and whatever go out of, out of business? This isn't really well published, but a lot of uh, loans were called callable, call, C-A-L-L, -L, callable loans. So you were making your mortgage payment. Maybe your grandfather had enough business for a while to make his payment. But then the bank, if it was a callable loan, and many were, say, hey, your farm, you know, and these numbers sound ridiculously small compared to what they are today because I'm doing it on an inflation-adjusted basis, but they called up your grandfather and said, hey, you owe us $4,000, you got 30 days to pay it. And no one could do a callable loan, you know, that's like paying your mortgage off, you know, instantly. I mean, how many people can do that? Very, 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 very few. So that just squeezed the middle class on down in America. So just wanted to get that out there. So what these banks can do, they did this, in my view, in more or less a deliberate manner. But that's a story for another day. So the question was, what about now? Yeah, I've got many instances where um, people have uh, contacted me and asked, you know, what can they do? Their bank doesn't want to send a wire to Miles Franklin for gold. They're saying that they know, and it's their money. Well, it, <laughs> that's another story. I mean, the deposit you make isn't your money, and that just freaks people out. But that's the truth. It's a, you're an unsecured depositor, and it's the bank's money, and you're giving them a loan. And so, do they have control over their money? And that's a, a legal question I can't answer. But what I can give you is more than one incident. In fact, numerous, and it's becoming more prevalent as you outlined where people call up and they want to wire money, not necessarily for precious metals, for any you know, business transaction, a loan payoff, um, uh, you know, a uh, down payment on a house, whatever it might be. And uh, these banks are giving a lot of pushback. And it's like, well, why are you, what's the money for? You know, they never asked that before. It's like, why are, you know, why are 10 grand to, you know, XYZ entity? And they did it. You know, it's my, it's, supposedly my money and I want to make this wire. And uh, a lot of the online transactions, HSBC was down for a while. One of my friends in Panama, now whether it was just the Pan Panama branches of HSBC or not, I do not know. I do know he's in Panama and I do know he sent me a photograph of what the bank sent him. <laughs> and it's basically can't do anything. We're, we're down for online banking. And this is happening more and more. And if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what does. As far as the bank run is concerned, that happened in the 2008 crisis. And I forget the, I think it was a congressman, Kosorsky or something like that. You may recall, Dunnigan. And there's a video out there still. It may have been removed. They talked about the banks were starting to panic because there was an electronic run on the banks. And people were taking their money out because you can do it in many instances if you're on online banking and, and move your bank funds into, let's say, a, the stock market or into a money market or into treasury now 
and buy T-bills. And so the banks really panicked in 2008. Transitioning to the present day, Morgan addresses concerns about individuals facing difficulties in accessing their funds for various transactions. He recounts instances where banks refuse to facilitate wire transfers for purposes, such as purchasing precious metals, loan payoffs, or down payments on houses. This raises questions about the control individuals have over their own money, prompting a deeper exploration of the legality and security of deposits. Morgan emphasizes the growing trend of banks facing cyber attacks, citing a recent incident in China involving the purported largest bank globally. The aftermath of the cyber attack disrupted the bank's ability to transact in the treasury market, revealing vulnerabilities in what is traditionally considered a secure financial space. This prompts Morgan to express his primary concern about the financial system, the increasing threat of cyber attacks. The conversation shifts to the liquidity challenges faced by banks, particularly in the wake of rising interest rates. Morgan explains how depositors withdrawing funds from banks to invest elsewhere, such as money market funds or treasury bills, compounds the issue. The reliance on long-term bonds with high interest rates poses a dilemma for banks, leading to substantial losses on their books. Well, that's happened again because the interest rates have gone up and most people are getting next to nothing on their bank account are moving into money market funds. It takes them out of the banking system and also into T-bills. I think it's treasury now. You can go to and buy it directly yourself. It's not very difficult. So the liquidity of the bank with the deposits of your money that they consider or is legally theirs is uh, shrinking rapidly. And this, of course, is very, very difficult for the banks because most of their securities to back up their business of banking is in 30, 20 year and 30 year bonds that they have to sell at a discount because the interest rates are so high. So to make them pay the 5% that's required for somebody to buy the bond, they've got to discount the bond 30, 40%. And this is huge losses on their books. And so we're in a mess. And, um, you know, my advice is if you have more than $250,000 in the bank, you should really consider putting that extra somewhere else. Obviously, I think the precious metals is probably the safest. I don't believe in real estate right now. Mike Maloney, my friend, did a special update on Thanksgiving a couple of days ago, talking about the uh, Schiller Index and that uh, we are in a bigger real estate bubble than we were in 2008 when he called it. And Mike was uh, traveling around with Robert Kiyosaki at the time. And Robert would open up with, you know, real estate is going to have a big bust. And uh, of course, he's the king of the real estate investor on a, a cash flow basis. And he's telling people that are flipping houses or leveraged in the real estate market to get out and get out now. And of course, he's right. And now Mike is doing it again, saying this is it. And I had to laugh because what he said just resonated with me so strongly. And he said he gets a lot of excuses as why certain areas are exempt from that happening, you know? And I was a broker in Florida, and I said, you're going to have a crash. I, I was on the same page as Mike, basically. And I said, you're going to have a crash in, you know, real estate. Oh, no, in Florida, it's not going to happen because we've got Disney World and all these tourists, and we've got so much, uh, you know, tourism and so much money, and there's so many high net worth people. The real estate won't affect us. And I thought, man, this is crazy. This guy is so smart and so good at the markets, but he's blind to his own market. And sure enough, the Florida market went down just like everywhere else when the big contraction happened in real estate in 2007 and 2008. So I know it's just doomy gloomy. Again, I'm shooting straight out from the head and the heart. I'm not making anything up. I'm telling you the way I see it. And I think the banking crisis is starting to accelerate. In light of these challenges, Morgan advocates for a prudent approach for individuals with substantial savings. He recommends considering alternatives for funds exceeding $250,000 in a bank account, expressing skepticism about real estate as a safe investment. He aligns with Mike Maloney's warning about an impending real estate bubble, drawing parallels to the 2008 crisis. To prepare for the potential challenges ahead, Morgan offers practical advice. He suggests starting a garden as a means of self-sufficiency, even in apartment settings, emphasizing the importance of truthfulness and self-awareness. 
He encourages individuals to make informed decisions for their families, including strategic purchases of food staples. As a financial expert with a keen eye on precious metals, Morgan recommends considering gold and silver as a means of preserving wealth. However, he cautions that such investments should be secondary to essential needs like food, water, and potentially exploring additional income sources. We have this bank in um, China, and I forget what it is, ICB something, and it's supposedly the largest bank in the world. And they were hit by a cyber attack. And that's something I just don't voice enough because that's my main concern about the financial system is cyber attacks. They were cyber attacked and it really messed up their ability to transact in the treasury market, which supposedly is the safest place you can be. Folks, having a long-term U.S. treasury is not safe. I'm here to tell you. If you think they can't trust the dollar, you know, six months from now, what it's going to purchase in the grocery store, you certainly can't trust it 20 or 30 years from now. And that's what the markets are telling us. The markets are showing us without a shadow of a doubt that we're in a position where the dollar is on its last days. So how do you prepare? Well, starting the garden is really a good place if you can. I mean, even in an apartment, you can put in these little, you know, herb gardens or whatever. Not that that's going to save you, but at least you can do something. So do I own self be true? And then the idea that the truth will set you free. And that's also, you know, maybe overstated, but it is, is also very important. And to not really be concerned with what others think. You know, if you are true to yourself and your family, then it's not too hard to go out and buy more, you know, foodstuffs, for an example. And I have always recommended, and I was way ahead on this food situation. I was talking about a food sort of about a year or a year and a half before it. Anyone said it in the mainstream. And it doesn't cost you anything more. I mean, it'll cost you more out of your pocketbook, but it's probably the best thing you can do. And certainly buy stuff you really eat. I mean, the idea that you buy, you know, something on sale or whatever that your family doesn't like, that's, that's a bad idea. Unless it's really popular and you, can, you know you can barter with. That'd be the exception. And then as far as freeze-dried food, I have a fair amount of it because it's easy, it's convenient, but it's expensive. You're really better off just buying staples and canned goods than to go that route. But if you have the ability or, or the need, the good thing is that they're all in buckets. you got a handle. You can grab and go with them. Uh, so you could consider that. But I would say, you know, food, water, maybe a second job or something you can do on the side well before you get into gold and silver. And if you have excess savings and you are at a fairly high level, it doesn't have to be above 250000 if you've got 20000 and you've got, you know, prepped up and you've got pretty much everything you need, certainly you can move into the gold or silver market and have that real money outside of the system. Because if the bank freezes up is, or there's a bank run or they reset to a new system where you have to have a real ID and the only way you're going to get access to your funds in the bank is to let the bank go into this real ID system where I call it the B system. Uh, you're going to be darn happy that you took, you know, took sufficient account of what's going on in the future and prepared for that 